All right, everyone, welcome to our coffee break chat here live on Zoom. And since this is in fact a coffee break chat, if you happen to have your coffee with you, I propose a toast to all of you and to Margot Gale. Is this bad luck? <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> Cheers. And to cast iron, how could I forget? So we have a very, oh, that was a fantastic trick, Tony Robbins, of disappearing into the cast iron facade. Please do that again. <laughs> well, I was just checking for rust, you know. <laughs> do you have your magnet? Oh, <laughs> it's here somewhere. Very nice. Well, my name is Brad Vogel, and I am the executive director of the New York Preservation Archive Project. Now, it's a long name, but many of you know our work. But for those of you who don't, we are an organization, a nonprofit that is dedicated to telling the history of the preservation movement in New York City. Now, in a city this big and in a city that has had urban conflict over just about every single land use issue you could imagine, there's a lot of history to cover. But as we go about our, our work, we do see that some luminaries tend to pop up to the top of the list that we hear about again and again, or that really seem to have influenced the preservation movement that we know today. And one of those figures is certainly Margot Gale, the late Margot Gale. And so I'm especially pleased to be offering up a program today, a chat about this illustrious lady. Um, she was quite the woman. And you're going to be hearing from some great experts who are here to help us today. Um, each in their own way. Our featured speaker today is Tony Robbins. Now, Tony um, is someone that you may have taken a tour with over time. Um, you may know him as someone who's wearing a hat, and I did bring this along today, Tony, in your, in your honor, <laughs> as I have received complaints that sometimes the backdrop tends to eat away at one's, uh, at one's head, it seems. Ah, uh, there we go. Perfect. That's a bit more like it. Now, who is Anthony W. Robbins? Oh. After taking a tour of Tribeca run by Margot Gales, Friends of Cast Iron Architecture in 1975, Tony changed his MA thesis topic. It was that impressive. In art history, from Venetian Renaissance paintings to New York's cast iron palaces. When he returned to New York from grad school, he volunteered with Margot from 1976 through 1981. It was with Margot that he cut his teeth as a tour guide, eventually becoming co-chair of walking tours, but also assisting Margot on whatever she needed assistance on. He credits Margot's recommendation for his eventual hiring by the New York City Landmarks Commission. So welcome, Tony Robbins. Oh, thank you so much, Brad, and thank you all. Well, oh, I, I can just hear the, it's muted, but I can hear the applause anyway, thank you. Oh, that's. This is not lovely. Um, I'm just beginning to get used to this whole Zoom, uh, Zoom phenomenon. Um, and I've got a few images. And I, I, I'm, so I think I know how to do this. I'm going to share the screen for a little bit, and then I'll give it back to you. Um, OK, it's not showing up wherever, for a minute. Ah, there we are. Um, and Tony, before you jump in, I'm actually going to introduce our, our co-host today. Uh, Yuki. Oh, uh, so sorry. Yes, so no, not a problem. So, Yuki mm -hmm. is an archivist and founder of the Soho Memory Project, a nonprofit organization that documents and preserves the history of Soho as a New York City neighborhood with a focus on the decades between 1960 and 1980. Very apropos for, for, for today's talk and for the subjects of Margot Gale and cast iron architecture. Um, specifically that window when it was a notably vibrant artist community. So Yuki, please feel free to say hi uh, before Tony takes uh, it away. Hi, um, well, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, Margot Gale uh, was instrumental in saving Soho by um, having, um, being very influential and in having it designated as a historic district. Um, she went up against uh, Robert Moses, along with uh, Jane Jacobs and Julie Finch, and they 
Well, they essentially beat him down. So hooray for Margot Gale. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you and welcome, Yuki. We were really glad you could make it today. So glad to be here. Thank you. So without further ado, Mr. Robbins, would you like to uh, lead us through some of these fine images? Yes. Um, are they showing up on the screen yet? This they is, are, yes. You can see this uh, note from yeah. the, uh, the clipping from the Riverdale Press? That is correct, yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, I was in my parents' house in uh, September of 75, not knowing what I was going to do uh, for the rest of the, for the weekend, and I spotted this article in the Riverdale Press, which is just a local paper, and I was all quite new to me, cast iron buildings. What are, and I was an art, trained as an art historian. I'd never heard of cast iron buildings. Um, and this was sponsored by the mysterious friends of cast iron architecture. I didn't know architecture could have friends in quite that way. Um, to go visit and see pre-Civil War cast iron. What the heck is that? And these are all typical Margot touches. Um, she's a brilliant marketer. I think that's what she did almost better than anything else. Um, here is the, uh, oops. I've got to make this work. There we go. You can see that, right? Uh, that's too fast. Here is the um, flyer for that set of tours, and you'll see it's from September 28, 1975. Um, and these were the these are the kinds of flyers that she did. Remember, this is this was all done on a typewriter, basically. I mean, the technology was a, was a little different, um, so that means she had to find somebody to I don't know. How she got the image put onto the piece of paper. I mean, we think this is nothing of doing this sort of thing today, but this, this took some doing. And this to promote a tour that cost $2.50, right? Um, so I was intrigued and I, and I went down um, to uh, this nameless triangle, which is now called Bogarda's Triangle because of her efforts, uh, but that hadn't happened yet. And, and um, Tony, Tony, we'll be learning more about who this Bogardus is, right, along the way? Absolutely. Um, and there were 60 or 70 people and, uh, and wow. five tour guides and um, a woman of about 70, I think is what how old she was at the time, standing up on one of the benches, organizing the whole thing. Uh, and somebody was sitting at a table selling uh, books, uh, Margot's book on cast iron architecture, but uh, pamphlets of all kinds. And then you have to remember, this was 1975. No one knew what Tribeca was, really. Uh, most people certainly didn't. Uh, the the uh, the triangle was littered with uh, wine bottles from the nights before revels, um, and, and the place was deserted on a Sunday morning. It was, you know, and I don't think that's ever true of Tribeca anymore. Um, and, you know, Margo didn't invent the walking tour. That goes back to the Museum of the City of New York, and Henry, I think it was uh, Henry Hill Breed, I think, did the first in the 50s. Yes. Uh, but she really put us on, put them on the map. Uh, this is a copy of the New Yorker cover from October 13th, 1980, which just happened to come out the day after I got married. Um, and there is a group, unquestionably from the Friends of Cast Iron Architecture. They're standing in front of what is now the Donald Judd uh, Museum. It's, he was one of the very first to move into a cast iron building. in so that's at the corner of uh, Mercer and Spring. Uh, the fellow with the beard, I, I think is Don Pricer. I'm not quite sure. He's one of, one of our guides. Uh, but this is what we were doing on deserted streets. Uh, now, remember, this is a time when the Landmarks Commission was, you know, barely uh, 15 years old. Uh, preservation was still very much um, on the table for discussion. Like, is this a good idea? Is this not a good idea? So that very same day, I went back and looked, and on that very same day, that, while we were all wandering around Tribeca with Margot, here were not one but two articles in the Times that talked about the Friends of Cast Iron Architecture, and Margot, she was very, very good at this. Um, so it, you'll see it says preserving the visible past. Uh, the, the Victorian Society in America was indeed founded in her kitchen. Um, and that was her first uh, major organization. And when she got finished setting that up, she turned to cast iron architecture. If you look down at the bottom, Mrs. Gale saw it. Let's see. The, she uh, brought into existence another useful institution, the Friends of Cast Iron Architecture. At her eloquent, persistent urging, the Landmarks Commission designated Soho. I mean, there, there it is. And on the right, a different article by Ada Louise Huxtable talking about the Friends of Cast Iron Architecture again, worrying about that uh, cast iron fire uh, tower that was only recently finally restored um, up at uh, 125, uh, just south of 125th Street. Um, uh, so she, she had a huge, a huge impact by running tours. Uh, 
by, uh, this was her apartment, by the way, uh, on West 9th Street in the village. Um, her, I forget what floor she was on. It was a huge apartment, uh, sort of longer than wide. And there was a kitchen in the back and all the good stuff happened in the kitchen. There was always coffee cooking on the stove and there were people uh, licking envelopes and um, uh, writing notes um, on whatever it was that, that was happening at that moment. This was just across the street, by the way, from the, uh, the uh, the uh, Jefferson Market Co Jefferson Court Jefferson Market Courthouse Library, which is one of her huge uh, campaigns to save a Victorian building. I think it was Ad Louise Huxtable who said that if they could quote if they could save that they could save anything. Uh, Victorian architecture not being in much in great esteem at the time. Right, right. Um, and you can see Tony actually right behind me in my profile uh, oh, yeah. a shot of that of Margot with the campaign poster for the effort to save the Jefferson Market Courthouse. It was a fabulous effort, you know. Um, so here is Margot uh, on the left as a uh, very uh, youthful, and on the right, uh, towards the end of her life, she looked to be 101. I mean, she was she was she was tough. Uh, you know, Margot could handle anything and anybody, and she did, but always in a way that you didn't feel that you'd been handled. Um, it was like you'd been you'd been invited in to help. Uh, and that was true whether you were a young volunteer like me or the mayor of New York. Um, because people somehow or other always managed to do what Margo asked them sooner or later. Um, and, again, and again, this was, this was, her, uh, this was her genius. So here's the uh, renewal card. And I mean, note the way that she writes it. Okay, it's, our dues are, only, are still you know, not next to nothing. But look, uh, mostly we want you as a member. Right now, somebody else wouldn't have done that. It would have just said, please get us your dues or we're gonna stop mailing you stuff, um, more or less. No, this is Margot. this is personal, we need you. Um, and as a result, she had lots of members all over the country. Um, one of my cousins who I is watching right now, uh, who lives way out, far from New York, became a member. And I, I think kept it up for as long as the organization was there. Um, and then she did things like this. I mean, look, the cast iron apron, the new cast iron apron going along with the cast iron t-shirts, these little buttons. I am a friend of cast iron architecture. Uh, the, the membership card came with a little magnet on the back. Why? Well, cast iron buildings sometimes look like stone buildings. How can you tell the difference? When you get used to the idea, you can sort of look at how they're deteriorating. Stone wears away, cast iron rusts and fall off. But otherwise, a magnet is your best bet. And you, it's not, you know, I would go down to Soho and there would be dozens of people at any given day. Well, maybe that's a slight exaggeration. Half a dozen people at any given day with their card and their magnet checking buildings all over Soho. Um, it was just, just absolutely brilliant. Um, then she could talk people into doing things. Um, on, look at the top, whoops, my computer just went, there we are, pardon me. Uh, I don't know why that happened. Bear with me just for a second. There we go. Is that uh, visible? All good. Okay. Uh, friends of cast iron architecture looked at the, and again, remember she had to find a printer who could get the right uh, print to make cast iron look like it's actually iron. But look on the right, who are the honorary co-chairmen? Henry Russell Hitchcock, the great architectural historian up at NYU, uh, and Sir Nicholas Pevsner uh, in England. Hmm. Uh, and I think I remember asking her, oh, are they gonna be at the meeting? <laughs> Say, no, of course not. They just lent their names, but they lent their names to Margot because she was Margot. Um, and they knew her because everybody uh, knew Margot. Look on the right, oops, sorry. Look on the right and uh, look at the bottom. This is a little note that she sent out to the, uh, uh, the guides at the end of every season. Was, there was always a little party but look at the, how she ends it. But to you, and especially those tour guides who slogged through the beautiful park for two long hours, you are a hero. I mean, that's, that, is, that is so Margot. That, that's how she did it. She had no actual power. She didn't run a city agency. She didn't have a giant nonprofit. Cast, Friends of Castor Architecture was just basically her hobby. I mean, you could argue. Um, and yet somehow she was in the middle of everything. And I, I wasn't there for the Soho fight. I joined you know, shortly after the designation, so I don't know the details, but uh, that Times article, I think, said it all. She was uh, hugely important. I just have a couple of more images that you might find interesting. Sure. Now, uh, now Tony, she also I, was very adept at using politics. I mean, she didn't hold an official role, but she was, she was often working 
hand in hand with politicians and the political process to achieve her concrete results in the preservation realm, right? She was. Um, she, well, uh, 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 Warren Moscow once, uh, once called her the original reform politician. She actually ran for city council. I don't think she made it on. I don't remember the, exactly. She, she might have. I, I don't think so. Yeah, I think she ran against yeah. Stanley Isaacs in the 50s. She, the didn't, she didn't win. Right. Didn't win. But I she didn't. ran on the platform, let's get a woman into the city council or something like that, because there were no women in the city council. That's so Margo. Um, I think that's my last, oh, that's my last slide. That's why it's not going anywhere. Uh, never mind. Um, so um, the uh, famous, do you, I don't know if you're going to show it, Brad, the famous photo of uh, the signing of the landmarks law. Yes, let me pull it up behind me here. One moment. I'm doing these in my virtual background. We can there pull we it go. up. So let me make way here. You can see Mayor Wagner signing, <laughs> actually. So the landmarks law was the, the one that, there, there were two laws. There was a predecessor commission from 1962, which was to sort of investigate how to do this. It didn't have any real power. And then the commission per se was created in 1965 and Mayor Wagner signed the law. And nobody was really paying a whole lot of attention to it. There was no press in that room. Right, right. As the story is told. Margot, however, had been a reporter, or at least a stringer, I, for one of the New York papers. So she had a funny little camera that reporters had that could fit, was a, could fit in her pocket. Um, apparently that was a hard thing to have. It's not like today you take out your phone, you take a picture. Um, but she had one and she said, this is an, she knew she's, this is an important moment. She took out the picture and she, sorry, the camera, and she snapped that photo. It's the only photo we have. It is everywhere. Every history of preservation in New York, you will find that photo. And that's Margot. She's sort of, you know, she's Zelig. She's, she's, she's everywhere. Um, she came, she came to testify here. The first time I went to the Landmarks Commission, before I was on the staff, I, was, I, went, to, I went to a hearing um, at her urging. Um, it was about a cast iron building, I think. And she stood up to testify. And the then chair um, of the commission, this was before Kent Barwick, um, and I'm blanking on her name, uh, but the city planner who was, who, was, who was running the commission said, oh, Mrs. Gale, so lovely to see you. Which of your many hats are you wearing this morning? <laughs> because she had quite a few. Sure. So that must have been Beverly Moss Spratt. Thank you. It was Beverly Spratt. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, I'm so glad that you got into some of what Margo was really like, Tony, because I think that's one thing for me. I never had a chance to meet Margo, um, but she's clearly got this legendary status. So one, you know, along the lines of what you were saying, I just wanted to pull up one photo behind me here. And I had it up earlier, but I'll pull it up again. Now this is Margo. You have to move over. Move out of the way and let you take a look here. There this you go. is Margo Gale in about 2002 or so in a wheelchair next to, does anyone recognize the suit? Oh, is that Tom Wolf? Tom Wolf. Is this standing, two, Columbus, two Columbus standing, Circle? Standing outside, the, yep, two Columbus Circle in yeah. the protest. So she, you know, she had an incredibly long engagement with civic life. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, she always got awards. Every every year, it seemed that Margot, during that that period, was getting an award from a preservation organization of one kind or another, uh, because you know she, she was you had to do it. And if you ran out of well, who, have we done Margot Gale yet? All right, we're going to do Margot Gale, um, and, and she didn't really care about them as an honor. She cared about them as a marketing opportunity. Uh, so I was at one that I think it was the Landmarks Lion uh, Award um, from the uh, uh, Historic Districts Council. Uh, and there was a lot of people got up and said lots of things about her. And then she got up, said thank you. And then she proceeded to talk about her current cause, <laughs> which was municipal <laughs> sculpture. And then she handed out flyers with instructions on whom to write to, to, to protect. And that, because that was Margo, that's what she did. I can see that some of her influence has rubbed off on some contemporary preservationists as well. <laughs> I was, at a, I was at a gathering of preservationists. I forget, the, I forget the occasion. Somebody had organized it. A lot of people who were, had done it a long, for a long time. So there were people older than me there. Um, which I don't run into that often anymore. Um, and one of them said, you know, Margot was gone. Uh, Margot Gale was the mother of us all. Mm. Mm. Wow. Now, I'm, in that vein, Tony, we have someone on the Zoom today who really got to know Margot very well in her later years in a sort of personal neighborly way. 
So Franny Eberhardt, if you're on the line right now, I'm actually going to unmute you in case you'd like to share anything with us. So one moment here. And Franny, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, thank you for joining us. Welcome from Columbia County where we've had the first sunny day in the last five weeks, I would say. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, yeah, um, yeah I, when I got into preservation professionally, I started working at the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And of course I had in graduate school studied Margot's books and heard about her and I actually did by then you tell me know about cast iron architecture. Um, and I was very startled to find out that she lived, lived across the street from me because I had imagined that she lived in Soho, of course, or maybe the village. I knew she'd been active there as well. Um, but she had moved uptown. And one of the things that everybody should remember about Margaret was that she was very disabled. She was one of the bravest people I've ever known or probably ever will know because I never knew her when she could walk unaided. Tony, you did, and I'm not sure. I, we never talked about the disability. I assume it was rheumatoid arthritis, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, and no, what well, you don't, I don't know, whatever. Um, when I first knew her, she had to have somebody hold her. Uh, she had to hold your arm, and she had a very specific way to do it with a vice-like grip so that she was very steady on her feet. And then it went to canes, and then it went to walkers, and then ultimately she was in a wheelchair but she never complained and she moved on through all of her causes and all of our causes with enormous strength. So I'd like to call that out. She had things to overcome that the rest of us can't even imagine. Um, and then to her um, constant uh, advocacy, nonstop, uh, she joined us regularly for holidays and family events. Uh, we had to carry her, a little, little townhouse, we had to carry her up the stoop um, and she would always come with a little piece of paper in her pocket with notes on it about what she wanted to talk to you about. And it was usually a cause or, or something like that. I was usually baking the turkey, so I didn't really, <laughs> but um, I would, you had to acknowledge her zeal, but in this very gracious way. But also on the list, she would just, in case, she would write down the names of all the children over time, there were, I had two and my, my brother and sister-in-law had four. And so she tried to keep track of them all and what they were doing and what they liked, um, which was in, incredibly thoughtful and engaging. Um, she was a lady uh, that, of that generation, I would put Ada Louise Huxtable in the same boat um, and a few other folks who had a, a style and grace and tenacity and eloquence that we have a very hard time emulating now. Mm. It's, it's also, she was, you know, historic preservation was really cre the modern movement going back to when the, uh, I forget what organization it was in Washington that uh, went after what tried to, well, that succeeded in keeping um, Mount Vernon, Washington's, you know, George yes. Washington State from being- uh, Ladies' yeah. Association. Thank you. It's, it, it's women who did it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And in part, that's because there were an awful lot of very smart, capable women who weren't permitted, weren't expected to work uh, mm -hmm. in paid, paid jobs. They, had to, they got bored, they had to do something. Uh, they found preservation as a cause. Um, and Margo, it, you, well, so th that's part of it. The other part of it is behind every preservation success, there's always one person. That's right. Uh, oh. Whose life it has taken over. Yeah. Um, and that right. person is, is, is the soul of that battle. And Margo was the soul for quite a few. I mean, it wasn't just cast iron. That's what we all, you know, talk about with Friends of Cast Iron Architecture. But before cast iron, she'd done the Victorian Society. You have to remember back in the, 70, in the early 70s when the Victorian Society was founded, people looked down their noses at Victoriana. I, I was in graduate school in London at the time, and I had a cousin there who said, why do Americans all come over here and want to go see the most horrible Victoriana monstrosities? Nobody likes that. So having a Victorian society was actually a, kind of a challenging thing to do. Now it seems, you know, easy, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, but then she also was involved with the, uh, the Alice Austin House. I was in her kitchen once and I saw something about the Alice, Alice Austin House, and so I asked her about it, and she said, oh, well, that's not, you don't need to know about that. Uh, because I was there to help with cast iron architecture. I, I, was, not, I was not there to, to learn anything about uh, the Austin, Alice Austin House, but I learned later that she was instrumental in its uh, preservation. Um, and clocks. 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 Oh, gosh. Yes. She st well, she was very smart about this. Um, she was concerned about uh, the old um, A.T. Stewart store 
the world's first department store, more or less, uh, which had been, now a city owned building, the buildings department lives in it, it's at Chambers and Broadway. Uh, and it was decrepit and it had a clock, which the Sun newspaper had put on when the Sun had taken over the building towards the end of the 19th century, which is why it was called the Sun Building for a time, and the clock wasn't working. So she was concerned about the building, but she thought that she would, as I understand it, again, I wasn't involved yet, I hadn't met her, uh, you know, people will notice the clock. So she set up a table, this is how it was described to me, with, with volunteers sitting at the table asking people to sign a petition to get the clock working again. And of course, what that did was, oh, I can get interested in clocks. We're all interested in clocks. Old buildings, what are those? Clocks, clocks are cool. We don't have that many clocks on buildings. Uh, you know, she sort of, she was, she just knew. She knew how to get to people. And from that, she went on, but then she did more. She really did care about clocks. She got the clock in the, uh, uh, the library, the uh, Jefferson Courthouse Library, I think was one of her, one of her efforts. Uh, yes, yes. And, and there too, Tony, she, she was smart about it because she got the clock going first, realizing right. getting the clock going would then lead to exactly. a successful effort to bring the building online again. Exactly. Am I still on, Brad? You are. Okay. Yes, go right ahead. Anyway. And then I'll go away. Then you should mute me. Um, <laughs> at that um, HDC uh, Lion event, uh, she let her secret out. She said, now, you know, if you have a big job to do, you've got a real preservation, she said, start small. Start with a piece mm -hmm. of it. That's what I did with the Jefferson, Jefferson Market Courthouse. Mm. With the clock, because it was a hard, I mean, it's really a pretty weird building, but the, everybody loved the clock. And when they fought to, to, to save the clock and pay for repairs of the clock and get that ringing again, right. all the village knew that that building was something special. Right. Absolutely right. She, it's kind of, Tony Wood, I believe, is on this. And I think he once said something about, if you've got a big job, just cut up the elephant, cook, cook the pieces one at a time. And, well, and then, of course, she went further with the clocks. A lot of the clocks were in city-owned buildings. Um, and there was a fellow, Marvin Schneider, Schneiderman, Schneider, um, who was sort of, as he worked for DGS, the Department of General Services, and it was, he had a hobby, but he liked, deal, you know, tinkering with the clocks. She wanted him to become the city's clock master. There had never been a city clock master that I'd ever heard of anyway, maybe in the 19th century, perhaps. Um, and she wanted to be Marvin. Um, and guess what? Marvin became the clock master of the city. It was half of his job and it was as part of his official responsibilities. Now, who else would have A, thought about clocks on city buildings, B, thought that they might need a clock master and then C, figure out who that should be and then D, lobby the right people and E, make it happen. But that's Margo. And it's just one little thing. Now I see Mr. Wood actually, because Franny mentioned him, has something in his office there. Is that, is that a cast iron facade, Tony? Well, I just pulled this out of, of my closet of uh, all sorts of archival things. This, this is an actual poster board of the Sun Building that Margo used in her efforts that at some point she gave to me, and it's been in my closet uh, ever since. And on the back it says, a photo by Edmund Gillen, Sun Building, 1846, Broadway and Chambers, from Victorian Society, Margo Gale. But I mean, this is this is what she did. I mean, you know, did the posters, and uh, I just want to add, she came out of politics, so she was very involved in political clubs. So she really, in my opinion, brought into preservation the kind of activism, organizing politics, flyers on the chairs, uh, you know, kind of what Andrew Berman has, you know, as a politician, brought into you know, GVSHP's activities. Uh, but she was kind of the first to do that. You couldn't go to an event, whether it was, it wasn't her events often, she'd go to your event and put her flyers on your chairs uh, <laughs> to promote her cause, which was absolutely brilliant. So I think she, she brought the political stuff in. And, and one thing, and the other, Tony, to maybe, I don't know if you can add to this, because it may have been before your time, it was before my time, but the whole, the whole Jefferson Market fight uh, was a very, very important early fight in the village. And I think, it, it, you know, she had worked for the city, uh, and I think in the press office, uh, the Wagner administration. That victory, I think when Wagner saw the political energy and excitement and constituency that Margot and others, but Margot mm -hmm. organized around that, I think he began to understand there was, there was something going on here. I right. uh, wouldn't accuse him of being a preservationist, but he certainly could put his finger in the wind and see what was what was going on politically. Right. Well, thank you, uh, Tony. Tony Robbins. Before we uh, get back to you, I did have one question for Yuki. Yuki, 
given that it seems like we have lots of people on this call who worked with Margo or have things from Margo, um, do you in the SOHO memory project have any objects from all this advocacy that led to the SOHO cast iron district? Uh, I do have, I, I have one um, flyer from, from the Friends of Cast Iron Architecture. Um, that's like an inv another invitation for a walking tour. And I also have um, some documents from other groups um, from Julie Finch's Artists Against the Expressway. And, um, but um, I don't have actually that much on Margot Gale, but she's fascinating. I was just reading up on her and she was able to, um, she was able to, at, at first um, Landmarks was only gonna designate Green and Broom Street um, as, as a historic district, but she had this petition campaign where she would, she would send individual petitions so that it wasn't a list of names like each person would send their own individual petition letter into him into mayor lindsay to get the idea in front of him and so he gets hundreds and hundreds of letters and margot gale herself would sit at a card table on west broadway and ask artists to fill out these petitions and she'd fill the box and then she'd send it to um, Mayor Lindsay, and he and he said, and she imagined that he said, "Oh, what a lovely box! What is this?" And they <laughs> open it, and there would just be these hundreds of letters. And he'd get them every week, sent because she would put the postage on to make sure that they were sent. And at somewhere, I think she she talks about she doesn't know exactly what happened, but she thinks that he somehow brought it to landmark, saying, "Look, all these people want Soho to be." to be a historic district. So, you know, and, and, and I think that's one of the ways in which she got um, it to go beyond Green and Broom Street to cover the entire area. Okay. And so she really, you know, used all of her resources. She partnered with the Soho Artists Association and, you know, she got a lot of artists to decorate the box and, <laughs> and she really just really used all of her connections to do it and she did it very effectively um, very cool. yeah and um, um I, I know we have to actually get to tony tony robbins telling us about cast iron architecture proper so we'll do that in a moment but yeah because we have a wealth a cornucopia of preservationists on the line today who happen to know margot and work with her i did want to quickly bring in jay shockley who had something to mention um Hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention, I did get to know Margot very well for several decades. I was on the Landmarks Commission's research staff for 35 years, retired five years ago. Um, I spearheaded her 100th birthday party at the Century Association as, when I was on the board of the Victorian Society. So I, her daughter lent me, her daughters lent me dozens of photographs of her throughout her life. So. I'm not in New York City right now, but I have them on my home computer. So anybody that wants those shared, I can certainly share them when all this Beautiful. goes away. But more important than that, as long as Fran is still on the line, the day that literally the day that her daughters gave up her apartment, she called me down at the Landmarks Commission to rush up there to see what I could salvage. And I and other people who were in the apartment got um, every single archive that we could think of, including NIPAP, to get stuff of hers. Unfortunately, a lot of libraries didn't want the books that were remaining because she had a lifelong habit of scribbling in them and putting newspaper clippings in the books, which deteriorated the paper of the books. But the very important thing was that I personally salvaged her entire slide collection of architectural um, slides. It's an enormous file box. It's probably about 5,000 slides. Um, I applied to NIPAP for a grant, which I didn't get. Anybody that could assist me in any fundraising to scan and label all those slides. The slides date from the mid 50s when she was a reporter. They're all color. I haven't seen everything. Um, I've only seen a very small sampling, but Based on what I saw, she had an eye for all the icons of New York that were going to be demolished. So these may be some of the only color images of some of New York's lost buildings. 
Wow. And yes. There, there are tons, obviously, of, of SOHO um, in early periods before the designation and all that kind of stuff. So this is a, an invaluable collection that I need assistance at some point in dealing with. Okay. Well, no, thank you very much for letting us know that, Jay. And I just wanted to, for one moment here, I'm going to unmute everyone for a chance to clap because I do think it's super, super important to recognize people who go out and save archives and save records because here at NIFAF, we realize that is critical. There is no story if no one saves the archive. So, three, two, one, and... <laughs> Yay. So thank you to everyone who's out there working to save archives in a critical moment. Um, if I may add, uh, Jay, if you're looking for a place to donate any of my really? no. collection at the New York Historical Society, because I had a couple of drawers full of stuff and I needed to get rid of them and I called up and asked if they were interested and they were. So there they sit and I uh, just add, I'm, they're interested in this. So they're really building a historic preservation um, uh, archival collection. Uh, so if you need a contact, I can get you one. Okay, great. And I've muted everyone again. So uh, definitely make sure the two of you connect after this is over. Um, okay. And just one more thing. Go for it, Yuki. I'm also planning on doing a batch of digitizing and maybe we can work together to get some of the Soho stuff um, digitized, Wonderful. so let's be in touch. Okay, great. Now, cast iron architecture. Tony Robbins, what in the world is cast iron architecture? How did it come to be preponderant during the middle of the 19th century in New York City? What is the story? Why did Margot Gale have this whole corpus of architecture to work with? It's been estimated that if, I don't, you know, this is one of those numbers that get thrown around. It's, it's very New York. If all the cast iron facades in New York were lined up end to end, they would stretch two and three quarters miles. How you figure this out, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but I, I saw that. Um, this is, we're talking about a mid to late 19th century phenomenon. Uh, what transformed the world? in the 19th, well, really beginning in the 18th century, but in the 19th century especially, the Industrial Revolution, uh, mass production. What is cast iron architecture? It is industrial revolution meets the classical architecture uh, and prefabrication. Uh, Bogardus, who was uh, a, just an absolute fixation for Marco, she eventually uh, wrote a book about him, but she was constantly thinking about him as the, as the, uh, the founder, really, of this whole thing, was an inventor from upstate, uh, Catskill, New York, I forget where. Um, and he invented a, a machine that made stamps with the image of Queen Victoria on it. This won him an, a prize and he went off to London to collect the prize apparently. And then as long as he was on the other side of the Atlantic, he went traveling in Italy. And then he put out a little pamphlet, uh, purportedly written by somebody else, but it sounds like him uh, because of the way it's written, in which he said it was whilst traveling, whilst, whilst traveling in Italy and admiring the, the monuments of the great, of greater monuments of the past, it occurred to me that it would be possible uh, to make inexpensive replicas of them in cast iron architecture for American cities. This is what he said. Now, Italianate was what everybody was doing in American cities. It wasn't his idea to bring Italian, Italian inspired architecture. In the 1850s, that's what was, that's what was happening. Um, but cast iron, what, you know, what a concept. Um, also remember that you know, New York had had a devastating fire in 1835 in Lower Manhattan that wiped out most of the, what's now the financial district, uh, including the insurance companies, which made it extra difficult. And so you know, the city had been a city of wood. Um, well, okay, we're gonna start using bricks in, in a big way. Oh, cast iron, it's fireproof. Wow. If we put our buildings in cast iron, we'll be fine. Uh, now, cast iron does not burn. It does, however, melt. Um, but it is harder to knock down something that's in cast iron. Uh, the, uh, the old Wanamaker store, which was A.T. Stewart's later store, which was on a ninth, right, right near Grace Church, Broadway and uh, 11th Street, um, occupied an entire city block, and it had a fire. It still took months, as I understand, to take it down just because it was that difficult. Um, the way that the, uh, well, the other thing that cast iron was at the beginning was the 19th century version of plastic. Like, you know, well, you can use iron in a building if you don't have to look at it, but please, uh, architecture isn't about 
architecture is masonry, architecture is brick, stone, wood, if necessary, but, but iron, please. Uh, in fact, the AIA, in one of its, which had just gotten organized, the American Institute of Architects, had a debate in 1859 um, with a pro and con, somebody speaking in favor of cast iron and somebody speaking against it. Um, and it was later printed, so we know what they said. And the person who spoke against cast iron had a very simple argument, a classical conservative argument. Architecture has always been made of wood, uh, brick, or stone. Therefore, architecture should always be made of wood, brick, and stone. End of discussion. Um, <laughs> um, but he had an extra piece. If you look at the building behind me, that's the Howard store. The actual, let me move over so you can take a close look. The Each individual window with its columns on either side and the little balustrade at the bottom and the arch at the top and the, uh, and the uh, capitals on the columns is modeled on an a Venetian building at the St. Mark's Library in, uh, in St. Mark's Square in Venice. It, it, they're very close, not identical, but it's really close. But you'd never mistake this building for that building because on that building, it's just one window on one floor, one set of windows on one floor, the next floor looks different. Well, cast iron is about economics as much as anything else. Um, you know, I don't have to have a, a dozen sculptors to do this. I just need some one sculptor to make, you know, each mold of a column or a capital and then I pour molten iron in it and let it set and then I when that's done I, I do it again and I can have as many as I want. So initially the buildings were just very repetitive. The same arch on the mm -hmm. same arch window repetitive on all four floors. Um, I, they're identical. So the other argument that uh, that the uh, fellow speaking against cast iron made was you know that's really monotonous. You know, we go down these streets and it's just arch, 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 column, 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 column. Hey, it's boring. Who wants to look at that? All right. So the architect, that, who, uh, that was Leopold Eidlitz, by the way, was that was the, uh, the, the opposing side. The pro was uh, Henry Van Brunt, who was, um, I think it's Henry. Well, anyway, Van Brunt, um, who was an architectural theorist and uh, very much an avant-garde guy. And he said, well, you know, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is monotonous. But you know, we are living in a mechanical age. This is the Industrial Revolution, effectively, is what he was saying. Um, and if uh, the result of living in that kind of age is to have endless arches that are monotonous, well, then that's what it should be, because that reflects our times. And there's nothing wrong with that. So that was really, really interesting. Um, McGardis and uh, D.D. Badger, who's the uh, only firm whose catalog survives, you'll find, go hunt it up online, you'll find it. Um, you can actually look at the catalog. They weren't interested in those details. They were just trying to sell buildings. Um, but they came up with, uh, okay, yes, it's fireproof. Uh, it's cheap, right? It's much cheaper to have the, uh, the, 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 the uh, prefabrication. Uh, but there's more. Uh, you know, New York's a growing city. And, and styles change, you know, this, it, okay, Italian is in this year, but you know, one day it's gonna be France, which is in fact what happened. So you don't wanna be stuck with an out of date design. You don't have to. Take your cast iron facade, melt it down and recast it in the new style. Now, I don't know if this any ever happened, uh, but that they were, you see, we're very versatile. And what's more, buildings are always on the move in New York because companies are on the move. The city's growing northward. Uh, you don't wanna, Having made an investment in a building, do you really want to leave it behind? Well, you don't have to. Uh, disassemble. This is all put together with bolts and, and hammers and tongs and all of that. You can assemble it, you can disassemble it. Disassemble it and cart it off to your new location and re-erect it. Now, that's never happened that anybody knows about. Um, the, there was the famous story of Bogardus' own buildings, the Lang buildings, which were on uh, right. were on Washington, Ave Washington Street from the 1840s, the oldest cast iron building surviving in New York. They were landmark, but they were in the way of a, um, an urban renewal project. Um, and so someone at Landmark said, well, you know, Bogarda said you can do this. Well, let's do it. If we're going to lose this. The federal government comes in. We can't do anything about it with urban renewal, but or the state, whoever was in charge. Uh, but we can take it down and put it back someplace else. And that is what they did. They took it. They unbolted all the pieces. They didn't know where to put them. So they left them in an open lot. And while they were trying to figure out where they could erect the building, Somebody else saw the lot, saw all this rusting old iron, saw that it was selling for, I don't know, $3 a ton somewhere and said, hey, let's take that iron and sell it to a foundry. Hmm. So off it went. Um, this appeared in a Ripley's Believe It or Not cartoon. And remember, this is New York in the 70s when it was very much perceived as a crime-ridden place. Uh, believe, it or in New York, believe it or not, in New York, someone stole a building. That, that, was, that was the headline. Um, there were a few pieces left. 
um, the idea was then to uh, cast the rest of them based on those models in uh, in fiberglass. They were the remaining pieces were stored inside. Unfortunately, while this debate was raging, in, where should we build it? I know, let's do it at the South Street Seaport Museum. That was one idea. Oh, that's that's not preservation. That's Disneyland because that's on the east side, and this was on the west side, and that's not right. Uh, the super in the building, at least as I heard the story told, uh, needed some space. Opened the door, saw this rusting metal kick, and, and threw it out. Um, Wow. If you do go to, if, if we ever get to go out and walk again, uh, <laughs> go walk to the South Street Seaport along Fulton Street and you'll see a sign that says Cannon's Walk. It's on a building that is, you can't figure it out, it, it really needs a sign, but it is an artist's impression of what the Lang stores could look like if they were done today. Wow. That's, that's as close as we've ever gotten to doing this. <laughs> Very nice. Now, Yuki, is there any particular cast iron building in Soho that is your personal favorite and that has significance to you? I mean, this is going to sound so cliche, <laughs> but I really love the King and Queen of Green Street. I mm -hmm. just think it's so at, um, oh, now I can't remember the address, but Green Street between Spring and Broom. The two buildings that come together and just are so magnificent. And um, I actually started um, the active part of Soho Memory Project in that building because I had my fundraiser there. So it, it's meaningful to me personally and to the project, but I also do think that it is really the cast iron royalty. Now, it's so interesting um, you pick those that you pick that one because that's the one with it's, it's very French in style. It's got the projecting uh, porch. Is that, the, that those are the buildings we're talking about? Yes. That's not economical. There, there's too much. <laughs> there's too much variety in those buildings. It wouldn't. It wouldn't work. But that tells us that the economics stopped being quite so important. And architects got into that. What can we do with this material? And that's why you got. Yeah, I agree with you. That that stretch of, of, of Green Street is just jaw dropping. Um, and I do also find it interesting that you could sort of just mix and match a lot of a lot of the elements you could pick from catalogs and, you know, and, and put them together, but also you might find that same element in another building because they use the same catalog. Um, so That's it's true. a sort of, you know, you can, you can dream up your own building and then parts of it might also be elsewhere. It's, it's, it's true. kind of exciting when you find the same element somewhere else in the neighborhood. If you look really carefully, you can see some. Or the same building in another city. Uh, the, Howard <laughs> store, the Howard store shows up in the, in the uh, Badger catalog, and there are several mini Howard stores in other places because someone said, oh, I like that one. Mm -hmm. No problem. We've got the molds. It's yours. Oh, I didn't know that. That's great. And, and speaking of cast iron in other places, now... NIPAP actually has some photographs from Margot's collection and in it you can see that she's either in correspondence with or visiting places like Richmond, New Orleans, other places that had cast iron architecture prominently featured in sort of the downtown central city. Um, but what about within New York City, Tony? Where are some of the places where cast iron crops up that people don't automatically think about it? Well, the answer is to look at the, uh, the, the cast iron uh, tour flyer, because we had four tours every spring and every fall. I mean, it was a lot of tours. Um, and the first one was Tribeca. Uh, no, none of these places have as much cast iron as, as Soho. Soho is like cast iron central. Uh, but Tribeca has some of the earlier ones, because it's further south. And that's the way the city developed. The earlier buildings are further south. Um, then there's, of course, Soho. Then there's Ladies Mile. Uh, along 6th Avenue, especially uh, between 14th and 23rd Streets. Uh, there are these enormous, well, the, uh, the uh, B. Altman store, uh, these enormous department stores, uh, not as many, but they, you won't see anything like that in Soho, so it's worth a visit. And then there's the area on the East Village. Um, the one that nobody ever thinks about, though, you don't hear about it, is Williamsburg in Brooklyn, downtown Williamsburg, right by the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, has, must have a dozen or so, maybe two dozen, I'm not sure how many are left, of cast iron buildings. Uh, one of them is a landmark at least. Um, Margot and uh, Alta Indelman, who was my co-chair of walking tours, uh, said, we got to do a tour here. And they actually went and researched the buildings and put together a tour. I was one of the guides. I learned how to do it, but it was, they, they put it together. Uh, and just once, um, and had a tour of the buildings. And remember, Williamsburg was not the hip happening place it is today. Uh, it was a scary place for a lot of people. Uh, so it took a little convincing 
uh, to bring people over to Williamsburg. Road in Williamsburg, is that safe? Um, but they came um, and they saw and they were happy because the buildings were spectacular. Uh, but about Margot and the other groups, yes, yeah, she, she had little, she had, she had cast iron groups all over the country because uh, every, every town has three, right? I mean, there's at least a facade if, or at least a storefront. And she would arrange for them to meet once a year uh, at an affinity, they were called affinity group meetings at the, Nash, the annual meetings of the National Trust. Pardon me while I mute my phone. The annual meetings of the uh, National Trust uh, had uh, some other organizations do this too. Uh, people had a chance if you're coming from all over the country to meet. And so Margot did that and there would be an eight o'clock in the morning breakfast, a cast iron breakfast, so to speak. Um, and there would be people from all over other cities. See, uh, Portland, Oregon has quite a lot. Uh, who knew? Um, New Orleans, of course, but um, lots of places. And she just made sure that everybody was in touch with everybody else. And there would be a little, someone would do a slideshow uh, or a talk. And that was, again, that was Margot. You know, if you get people talking about this, maybe th good things will happen. All right. Well, thank you so much, both Yuki and Tony Robbins. We are now going to move into sort of Q&A proper here. Uh, it's been great, though, to have so many questions sort of seep into the conversation and organically entwine with what we're chatting about today. Um, and I, I see that we're getting a bit, a bit long here. This is a long chat because there's a lot to chat about. Uh, but that's a great thing. If people have to leave, they can leave. If not, we're going to go into the questions. And I wanted to start with Mr. Wood actually noted that Tony Wood noted that he had some insight on Margot's archival practices. Well, so Tony, you are now unmuted. Well, since you know we are the archive project and we encourage people to to be our think archivally, Margot actually thought archivally, and you wouldn't know that from as Jay said, you know, when she died, her apartment was full of stuff. Well, that's only because she kept living. Uh, several times she got she she took care of her archives. You know, she gave archives to the Greenwich Village to the. Uh, courthouse, uh, the archives dealing with saving it, but several times in her life she thought she'd solved her archives and then she kept living and she kept doing more activism. So it's just kind of fun that she had an awareness to it, uh, but she could never get on top of it because she never stopped doing preservation. But I am going to turn that statement into a question because I think it's relevant to all of us and even though the other Tony on this call is such a young man, Mr. Robbins, what are the plans for your archives? Ah. You did a wonderful article for us about your research and I think on the World Trade Center, where you actually only are the only one with some documents that, that you had copied that were then lost in 9-11. But you don't have to, this is, you know, this is a somewhat rhetorical question, but there's so many preservationists on this call who have done wonderful things themselves. Uh, and, and you know, in the line of, of kind of mini Margot Gales here. Uh, and your stories are important. So, Tony, you don't, I'm putting you on the spot. You don't have to answer, but your papers are important too. Well, well, I, I'm I'm flattered. Thank you. Um, I've given two batches of them to the Preservation Archive at the New York Historical Society. They've got all of my World Trade Center papers, which I also scanned and stuck on my website as a as a digital archive because I could do that. I had permission to do that. I gave them all my Margot Gale Friends of Cast Iron stuff, but I, I but the library said, you know, you can't just scan these without getting permission. There are copyright issues, so I haven't figured out how to deal with that. So they're not online, but they're all sitting there. I still have a couple of drawers to go through, and 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 maybe I'll uh, if I can unload these on. I'm sorry if I can gift these uh, to the New York Historical Society. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I I will I will do I will do that. But anybody who here who's got preservation related materials, be in touch with their law. Again, once normal life, if it ever comes back, when it comes back, that's the place to be in touch with because they're very, they're very actively building that preservation uh, collection at the New York and, Historical and, and, On that note, Yuki, yeah. did you happen to uh, have any thoughts on what to do with your collection for the Soho Memory Project? My papers are also going to the New York Historical Society, so they'll be with yours and people will be able to cross-reference and use, use all the material and hopefully it'll be made accessible into the future. And if anyone is hesitant about approaching the New York Historical Society themselves, that's one of the things we've been able to do as the Archive Project. We have a very close working relationship with them, so we're happy to broker a, a relationship or help you 
figure out how to how to approach them and, and get enough information on your papers so that they'll know what uh, what you might be offering them. So that's what, something Brad has done for a number of people. So uh, right. we're in, I'm happy including me. Thank you, Brad. You are most welcome. Yes. Well, well, the NIPAP has actually brought the librarian who's organizing this onto our board. Uh, very so. Yes, he has to take the stuff now. <laughs> All right. Let's oh, see. Franny, Franny's got her hand up. Franny, Franny, let me just unmute you. Go for okay. it, Franny. I don't know where you find that little thing that you can. Anyway, um, I also gave some Margo Gale stuff that I had uh, to the library, and uh, he, the guy there, Michael, right, um, was delighted to have it, and he said that it is used, uh, particularly in the summer. There are always students, and he said, coming from Europe, who want to know about Margo, want to know about cast iron, et cetera, et cetera. So you're not just stuffing it somewhere. It actually, I think, will be used in the future. Good to know. Now, I would really want to move on to someone else who, who knew Margot. And one moment here, let me find him. Frank Sanchez. He's there. And Frank, you are unmuted. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, it, was, it was just terrific listening to all these stories. And um, I guess my biggest claim to fame is that I have a magnet. Aha. Magnet ah. that Margo passed out for <laughs> and and the reason that I have that is that um I guess Margo was like part of my life for 50 years. She came to Columbia when I was in the preservation program there from 67 to 69. And she and Giorgio Cavalieri had just finished the Jefferson Market Courthouse at that point. And she came and spoke to us because Jim Fitch admired her greatly as a woman in historic preservation and as a model for other women who might want to come to Columbia to the preservation program, which was at that time very male dominated, male architect dominated. Um, and he was fighting to change that. And so he brought her and then he made a big deal out of um, Giorgio's designs for the library and we all had to understand what Giorgio had done in adapting that building from a courthouse to a library and it became like one of our beacons and so I met Margot then I don't know if I actually spoke to her but I met her then because I remember that and then um, in 1969 I went to work for the commission uh, fresh out of Columbia, and um, she was involved at that point in trying to get Soho designated, and that must be when I got the magnet, <laughs> because um, I watched around Soho a lot with her and many other people, um, a lot of Victorians at that point, Victorian society people, um, and I've always kept that magnet, and then that eventually got designated in 1973. And then I shared a big moment with Margot when the Bogardus building got stolen in 1974, <laughs> which was one of the more bizarre things that ever happened in New York. And I remember, you know, commiserating with her about the stupidity that had happened. It was just shocking. And I was still um, at Landmarks uh, when or I was back at Landmarks again when the thing actually got re-erected, which was 1981 by Bayer Blinder Bell down in the seaport. There was a, like a fake Bogardus building put up and I remember all those controversies. I wish I could remember what Margo said because she was a constant presence um, at the Landmark uh, when I worked there from 1978 to 1985. And then she turned up at the National Trust all the time because of what Tony said. She established all these chapters of cast iron groups around the country in Portland, you mentioned, and many other, St. Louis, uh, many other places. And she was a constant present at the, at the um, National Trust for all of my tenure there. And then when I came back to the Municipal Law Society, she was there again. I mean, she was really old at that point, but I remember her being, you know, essentially carried up the steps because that was not an accessible mm. location uh, at the Villard houses. And she used to come to things right to the very end. She never changed. If there's any 
person who has inspired me as an advocate for historic preservation, it's Margot Gale. Mm, that is supreme, Fr Frank. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think we will close things out there. A special thanks to my co-host today, Yuki Ota of the Soho Memory Project. Thank you for joining us. And also our featured speaker, Mr. Anthony W. Robbins, Tony, thank you. And I'm going to unmute everyone now in case you feel like clapping. Thank you. Thank you all so thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me. You're most welcome. Thank you. Oh, I'm so great. I put Sunday, you know. I got everything. I got the locks. I got. Thanks, I got everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And they had spirits. And they had spirits. Thank you, Brad. You are most welcome. Thank you for joining us. Gary said. Yes, thank you, Brad. Take care. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. How are you? I think too many people go here. I think the manual doesn't get people.